Welcome back from lunch. Go lunch. <laughs> um, welcome everybody, my name is Dan. Uh, I will be your friendly moderator for the next hour and a half as we talk about doing social impact investment well. So that's going to be our topic. Um, I have with me an extraordinary group of amazing people who I'm going to introduce you to. Um, before I do, I've got a couple of jobs to do. Uh, the first is a word from our sponsor, partner. Sponsor or partner, I get confused, but I know who they are. They are EY. Um, for those of you that get this a little bit confused, EY stands for Ernst and Young, not Ernest and Young. Um, so if you have been walking around saying Ernest and Young, I have just saved you further embarrassment for the rest of your life. Um, and my great friend Christopher Thorne is here from Ernst and Young somewhere. And uh, Christopher is doing some really exciting stuff tomorrow with EY, JB Weir, and everybody's favourite group, Akina, uh, who are actually launching a report on impact investing and the state of impact investing. Um, so that's happening tomorrow. I have just realised that I have no idea how you get access to that report. Um, but I'm sure Akina will publish it on their website, maybe, if someone from Akina nod ahead. Um, but uh, I'm sure that there'll be some good stuff in there because all three of those organisations have very smart people um, and whatever they're putting in that report, I'm sure, is worth reading. So, the second job I have is to explain a little bit more about what we're going to cover and what we're going to discuss and why you might find this stuff interesting or important. My dad is half Chinese, half Indian, and he's from Singapore. And my mum is Dutch, blonde hair, blue eyed Dutch. And my wife is half French, half Creole from Mauritius. I have three kids, they are just confused. Um, <laughs> and, and I grew up in a house that had, uh, that, that where my parents spoke five languages between them. So my dad speaks Cantonese, Hokkien, and Bahasa. My mum speaks Dutch. And all of us kids, all we speak is English. Uh, which is kind of a sad fact, right? But um, why did that happen? Firstly, I'm not that intelligent. Um, but secondly, and the story I run with, is the only language they actually shared is English. Um, so that's the only language we learn. And I think as we enter or as we come to this space, we're all coming to this space from different backgrounds and we all have our own languages. Okay, so um, we have a language of government, we have a language of the, the mission-driven sector and um, that we sometimes call non-profits. Uh, we have a language of finance and we have a language of the entrepreneur and there's all these different languages we come to uh, this space with. And that can be really confusing because sometimes we're using the exact same words but we all mean very, very, very different things. And so what I wanted to do was just equalise the language, um, not around social impact because I hope we all agree on what that is, um, but on the word investment. So when we use the word investment today, just for today, um, if you're from government, you do investment. Okay, you put money into things that you expect to get a particular outcome from, it might be putting money into a program or a piece of work. Um, that's awesome. It is not what we're talking about today. Um, if you're from philanthropy, you often invest in things. You invest in organizations, you invest in programs, and you do that because you are looking for impact or outcomes, and you do that um, usually through granting, okay? That is awesome. It is not what we're talking about today, okay? So what we will be talking about today, and I'm glad no one's running for the exits, um, is we are gonna be using the word investment in the way that finance uses the word investment. And typically, that means one of two things. You are either lending someone some money and expecting them to pay it back with interest, or you are putting money into a business to own part of that business, and therefore you expect to share in some of the profits of that business. So when we use the term investment today, that's what we're talking about. Um, and uh, we're gonna talk about the ways in which that can be done well, poorly, um, why you might do it, and what it means to the different groups of the, the different people and their organizations here. Uh, so lastly, why should you care about any of that? Um, 
The oldest of my confused children, um, he is eight, his name is Jude, he came to me on Saturday morning and he said, Dad, I'm going to start a car wash business. I said, awesome. I said, do you, have a, uh, do you have detergent? He said, no. I said, do you have a mitt, you know, one of those things to wash the car? He said, no. I said, do you have a bucket? He said, no. I said, well, mate, that stuff's probably going to cost you 25 bucks. I said, do you have 25 bucks? He said, no. I said, well, what are you going to do? And he said, well, can't you just give me 25 bucks? And I looked at him as only a capitalist pig of a father could. <laughs> and I said, I don't think so, kid. And I said, but I'll give you two options. Here's the deal. I said, I'll lend you 25 bucks. And I said, once you've washed enough cars, you can pay me back that 25 bucks and $5 of interest. And he looked at me and he said, I don't want to pay you $5 of interest. And I said, OK, well, the second option is I'll give you 25 bucks, but I want to own part of your business. So every time you wash a car, I want to get a dollar. And he looked at me and he thought about this really, really, really hard. And he, he looked at me and said, you know what? I said, what's that, mate? And he said, Auntie Natty, which is my sister, she has all that stuff. And as a family, we're supposed to share things. So I'm just going to use hers. <laughs> So I learned three things on Saturday. The first is that um, he's much smarter than me, which wasn't that much of a surprise. Um, secondly, I have a budding entrepreneur as a son. And thirdly, he may be a communist. Um, <laughs> but the point being, for many of you in the room, you also need, you need resources, like Jude does, to either start your business or grow your business. Okay? And unless you have an auntie natty, you may need to either borrow that money from somebody or seek investment as a part of your business, as equity. Um, and there are ways to do that well and there are ways to do that poorly. There are ways, there are good reasons for doing it and there are bad reasons for doing it. So we're going to explore all of that over the next hour and a half with you. So, introductions. To make sure I do this properly. So. Um, I'm joined with four different people from all over the world. Um, Catherine is from my hometown of Melbourne. Um, Catherine, all the way to the left there, is the CEO of the Lord Mayor's Charitable Foundation. And it's one of the foundations in Australia really pioneering um, support for social enterprise. They're funders of social enterprises and they have also invested in social enterprises. Um, so we're going to hear from Catherine about that experience. Um, Patty Chu uh, has joined us from Singapore, um, where she's based. Um, Patty is the member membership services director at AVPN, which is the Asian Venture Philanthropy Network. And um, Paddy does a lot of work right in the intersection between purpose organisations, foundations, government, academia, and many of the impact investing funds. Um, so she offers a great perspective there. Natasha um, has joined us. Natasha Garcha has joined us. Uh, she is the head of business development at IAX, which is the impact investment exchange. Um, Natasha works across a range of areas, developing investment products, working with governments on policy, um, and also working with uh, investors in the way that they engage with enterprises. Um, and to my left here is Cliff Pryor, uh, who is CEO of Big Society Capital. Um, and someone's calling me, that's really annoying. Um, uh, <laughs> and for many of you will know that Big Society Capital is the wholesale investor in the UK market and brings a really interesting perspective on how the ecosystem for investing in enterprises has developed. So um, in terms of the way that we will run this session, I'm going to ask each of the panellists to get up and they will share some thoughts on what social impact investing is to them. Um, what, what they think needs, uh, you know, what they think it looks like to do it well. Um, things that they might be excited about as this space emerges and develops and things that they're worried about, uh, as well as, um, I guess, some tips for young players um, and how they see this space emerging. Um, after they've spoken, so they'll do about five minutes or so of presentation, we will sit down, we will have a fireside chat um, minus the fire and uh, we will open it up to a Q&A. So please feel free to use the app and um, you know, once everyone's seated, um, we'll try and, I've got a bunch of really intelligent questions to ask and we can mingle some of your questions in with that um, as, as, as we go. So um, please feel free to start that off. But before we do, we did want to get a sense for maybe what people's experience with 
social impact investment was. So we're going to ask you two questions. Um, one of which, so the first of which, can everyone just put their hand up? Just everybody just put your hand up. Yep, excellent. So if you have, if you currently have or have ever used impact investment in your an enterprise that you're working in or associated with, keep your hand up. Okay, this is gonna be good. Um, thank you. And then secondly, uh, if you could take the app out, we did this yesterday, yes, so we're all familiar with this now. And what I'm gonna ask you to do, we should have a poll, so if you go onto the session and you click on the session, up the top should a, a, a little flag saying poll should register. Now, what the, the question is, and it's a scale one to five, and I'll come back to which one means what. But the question is, how well do you think impact investing is working for the social enterprise community? So how well do you think impact investing is working for the social enterprise community? Yeah, so one being um, terrible, not well. We're probably gonna throw rotten fruit at people on the stage at the end of the session. Five being, it is amazingly awesome which is not an overly popular choice at the moment, <laughs> but is great because that means we can explore why people are feeling that it's not going very well. So keep the answers coming through and keep the questions rolling once everyone has had a chance to share their thoughts. So without further ado, Catherine, you're up first, I believe, so uh, please feel free to use the, the you, you're welcome to sit or stand, completely up to you, and over to you. Kia ora. I think that's correct, and I'd like to acknowledge, uh, as we do in Australia, the traditional custodians of the land on which we're meeting, and pay my respect to the elders past, present and future. It's really wonderful to be here, and I always find conferences in New Zealand just that touch more philosophical than they are in Australia. So you're, you're a wonderful people. So my um, first uh, explanation is that I am a CEO of a philanthropic foundation. So when we look at impact investment, that is the lens I look through. And we're very much focused around you know, what impact we can have on the social and environmental issues um, that we're working with. So I just wanted to give you a little context about the foundation and then give a couple of examples of impact investments uh, to explain that. So the, these are the areas we're currently working in, aligned to the uh, Sustainable Development Goals. Um, so we're very specific about what we want to work on. And for example, homelessness and affordable housing um, and also food security, which are the issues that I'm going to talk about in a moment. So we, we don't go in impact investment out looking for any investment. We're looking for things that will actually make an impact in these areas that we've decided to focus on. And we base our work on data that we um, collect on the issues facing Melbourne. So we're, in a sense, the community foundation for Melbourne and we're set up in 1923 by the Lord Mayor then, and we've responded to all sorts of issues over the years. And I've only got five minutes, so I won't go, go on. We're also what we call an impact-driven foundation, so that means we try and use all the tools in the philanthropy toolbox. So a lot of you would have had grants for your social enterprises, so philanthropic grants to charities, but would we also know that we've got other um, capabilities? So quite often we work in collaboration, we um, undertake or fund research, we get involved with um, communications and sort of donor engagement programs. Um, and we, we actually take on a few initiatives where we actually go quite deeply into projects. So at the moment I'm working on an affordable housing challenge um, for Melbourne, which we're, we'll be announcing properly quite soon. So you'll see that impact investment is there, and that's alongside the other tools. So now we have to think, do we make a grant or do we make an impact investment? And so it's quite an interesting uh, new area. And for an impact investment, it comes from the, um, the corpus. So that goes through our investment committee, whereas grants um, go through our grants advisory panels and our other proactive granting mechanisms. So they're completely 
different um, pools. And the reason we really um, are passionate about impact investment is because it gives us more opportunity to make a difference. So we make grants of nearly $10 million a year, so our fund is $240 million. But, and we have an allocation of 2.5% in our strategic asset allocation towards impact investment. So that sounds very small, but that's actually $6 million that we can put towards impact investment. And as I was preparing for this talk, I started to figure out um, that if I could get it to a 4.25% uh, allocation, if I could get the board to agree to that at the next strategy day, that would mean we could have 10 million for impact investment and then also 10 million grants. So the grants come out of income, net income on the corpus, and the investments are actually from the corpus. Sorry if this is too basic for some people, but I think it's kind of good to understand how, um, how we think about it. So I first got involved in social... Um, uh, impact investment really through being part of the CEDIF, which is Social Enterprise Development Investment Fund um, initiative in the Commonwealth Government. So I was one of the philanthropy advisors on that. And that um, really got me very interested. And I was fortunate enough to um, know Peter Hero, who used to be CEO of the Silicon Valley Community Foundation and on the board of the Skoll Foundation. And they had already done a lot of work on impact investment. So um, that was an opportunity. We, we bought some of um, Peter and some of his um, other people, Richard Fay and Dependa Saluja, out to Melbourne and had some sessions for philanthropy in our own board and educated ourselves a lot more about impact investment. And I was able to attend the Skull World Forum. Um, and then we've learned through watching what the Rockefeller Brothers Fund and, and the many others in the US do as well. So our first... Um, I just wanted to give two examples. And the first one is in relation to increasing the supply of affordable housing, which is one of our very key drivers. And I'm sure you would know this, but in, in Australia, this is an issue, and in Melbourne particularly, and we have 0.7% uh, of private rental properties in Greater Melbourne are suitable for house, households living on income support payments. So that's you know, less than 1%. It's very dire. And the number of older women over 50 couch surfing has increased by 83% since 2012. So that's um, now 16, 100, sorry, 1,618 um, women, which, which is you know, a growing issue. Couch surfing means you know, you're staying at various friends and relatives and you don't have a stable home. And as we know, without a stable home, it's very hard to have a job and to stay in school and stay in education, etc. So this um, shows a few examples. One is a, the, the two on the right are gr a grant where we're redeveloping a service called Osdham House, which is increasing dramatically the accommodation. Um, so we do a lot in grants. That's a $600,000 grant, and it's got many interesting aspects um, in terms of the design and the leveraging of government funding and um, other, um, you know, selling off some of the land and all those creative things. But the, the one where the people are actually building a house, that, that is our first impact investment. And we, we made a, um, a loan via CIFA, which is Social Enterprise Finance Australia, of 1.4 million to them, to Habitat for Humanity, specifically for their program, which supports um, low-income families build their own houses. And through the sweat equity, they get 5% off the purchase price, and then they have um, no income no interest loans um, via Habitat for Humanity. So this has been going extremely well. We get really good returns um, within our sort of range of our investment um, returns. And um, the social impact, we get a lot of information about the families as they get the keys to the houses and um, the project, you know, the working capital that we've provided has really enabled them to speed up the, the housing that they're building. Um, in terms of the families, there were some very big bushfires in um, Ye, so there's a lot of um, you know, displaced um, families. The, the other area I thought might be interesting is in relation to food security. So the, the Melbourne's Food Bowl is a grant we made, which was to the Victorian Echo Innovation Lab at Melbourne University, and they've mapped Melbourne's Food Bowl, and they've um, found that we have the capacity to grow 82% of our vegetables and 41% of our total food needs, it's a really wonderful project. It talks about how we can drought-proof our food bowl and also how we need to save some of our very valuable agricultural land around the edge of Melbourne. So we've also done a lot of grants in um, food waste and food security. 
So we had an opportunity to fund a, pro, uh, a social enterprise, so it's a, a for-profit social enterprise called Yumi, which is a technology platform that's connecting food that's um, not, not needed and could go to waste directly to school canteens, hospital canteens and restaurants to divert um, that food into a, um, you know, a, use, a good use rather than um, going to waste. And they've diverted 22,000 um, kilos of waste since they started, which is less, I think it's about three quarters we've had so far. And in the from a financial point of view, it's a longer term investment, it's an equity investment, alongside a couple of other foundations and other private investors. So we know that's going to take more years to have a return, but the return um, will, will be very good ultimately. So someone said earlier in, the, in another session that philanthropy needed to be patient, and I I think we do know that there are times with social enterprise and with impact investment that we, we need some patience. Um, the last point I just wanted to make, my biggest worry, this was a question we were asked, my biggest worry about impact investment was just as a foundation knowing when to use a grant and knowing when to use an impact investment because the grants you know, are very uh, important and, and serve a certain purpose. Uh, and I think the other thing that slightly worries me but I think there's lots of potential, is just increasing the knowledge of the not-for-profit um, boards running social enterprises so they can use the grants or the investments very well. So that's two areas um, I think about. Thank you. <laughs>